This video was made possible by CuriosityStream. Watch thousands of high-quality documentaries and get access to Nebula using the link in the description. In 1952, the first jet airliner began carrying passengers, ushering in a new era. But it was also the same year this took to the skies, an enormous flying boat. Both of these planes were trying to predict the future of air travel, and one company was convinced that its flying boat would win out in the end, because it would be a more comfortable way to fly, where passengers could relax in a lounge, dine in a restaurant, even sleep in their own private suites. Flying boats were already the giants of the skies, and there seemed to be no limit to how big and luxurious they could get. The world just needed to be convinced that flying boats really did have a future. In the 1930s, two distinct kinds of airplanes had emerged, land planes and seaplanes. The obvious difference was one landed on water and the other needed a runway. But in the 1930s, that was an important distinction because many cities didn't even have airports, and runways were often little more than dirt or grass fields. On the other hand, the world is covered in water, so flying boats could land just about anywhere. Onto the Hudson River at New York came a mighty German Dornier flying boat on its first transatlantic crossing. Another milestone in the rapid advance of commercial aviation. While the development of land planes was constrained by a lack of suitable runways, Flying boats could grow larger, heavier, and more capable. And because they could reach parts of the world inaccessible to other planes, flying boats opened up air travel to far-flung exotic destinations. For the lucky few who could afford it, flying boats became the preferred way to travel, earning a reputation for comfort and even safety. Because over the middle of the ocean, the ability to land, in case something went wrong, was a reason why many thought flying boats were superior, and it helped calm the nerves of uneasy passengers. The rapid development of flying boats led many to believe that they were the future of long-range air travel. And in 1943, one iconic British aircraft builder began designing the next generation of flying boats, an enormous plane that would redefine air travel. But the plan would have to wait. 1943 was the middle of the Second World War. New airliners weren't a priority. But after the war, air travel would certainly boom again. And Saunders Row was going to be ready with an all-new flying boat that would put them at the forefront. And this is what they came up with. The largest, most advanced flying boat airliner ever built. They called it the Princess, a fitting name for an airliner with a luxurious two-level cabin featuring lounges, an actual restaurant, sleeper cabins, even a promenade for its 100 lucky passengers. The Princess was an odd-looking bird, but its unique shape helped reduce drag. Also aiding with efficiency was a new innovation, turboprop engines, some of the first ever on an airliner. And this plane was packed with them. Eight turboprops driving contra-rotating propellers through a gearbox, and another two powering single propellers. It was a complex design, but it meant the Princess could reach speeds of over 600 kilometers an hour, climb to 39,000 feet, and travel over 9,000 kilometers, practically doubling the performance of earlier flying boats. With the Princess, Saunders Row brought flying boats into a new era just in time for the 1950s boom in air travel. And the company was already designing the next generation to follow the Princess, a sleek flying boat with swept wings and turbojets. And for Saunders Row, it was flying boats all the way down. They were even developing the world's first flying boat fighter jet. But while the company seemed confident in the future of flying boats, the rest of the world wasn't. In 1952, the Princess took its maiden flight, and the enormous plane was a main attraction at the Farnborough Air Show. But airlines weren't interested. 
because a lot had changed during the Second World War. For starters, the war hadn't been fought with flying boats, but enormous land-based bombers, proving the long-range capability of land planes. And over the course of the war, thousands of new airports were constructed around the world, with long concrete runways. After the war, many of these new airports and the military aircraft using them were converted to civilian use. By 1950, all of the world's major airlines had abandoned their flying boats, switching to land-based airliners. It was simply a matter of economics. To land on water, flying boats needed stronger, bulkier fuselages. So they were naturally heavier, less aerodynamic, and difficult to pressurize. And flying boats were more challenging to fly, requiring additional training for pilots. And the plane's exposure to corrosive saltwater meant more maintenance. All factors which made flying boats less profitable for airlines. Still, Sanders Row remained committed to flying boats, convinced their advantage in size, safety, and their ability to operate on natural stretches of water without much infrastructure would soon spark their resurgence. All they had to do was convince everyone else. So the company went on an all-out marketing offensive, asserting that flying boats could still match the performance of land planes and boasting that the princess would mark the beginning of a resurgence in flying boat air travel. But desperation also seemed to be creeping in, as the company tried to argue that the switch to land-based aircraft had been driven by false assumptions, outdated figures, or even plain prejudice against flying boats. But the marketing seemed to fall on deaf ears. Even BOAC, Britain's leading airline, had no interest in the princess. Instead, they made a bet on the world's first jet-powered airliner, ordering a fleet of de Havilland Comets. And by 1954, it was clear that all the marketing in the world wasn't going to bring back an era of flying boats, because Saunders Row hadn't sold a single plane. After two years without a buyer, the company was forced to put the Princess and two half-finished airframes into long-term storage. The age of the flying boat was over. But not before Saunders Row engineers got the chance to dream up the ultimate flying boat. Flying boats couldn't compete with modern airliners. But maybe they didn't have to. Because in 1956, Saunders Row engineers came up with this, a design for a truly colossal 1,000 passenger flying boat aimed squarely at ocean liners, which in the 1950s were still carrying passengers throughout the world. Over a dozen were in service between Britain and Australia alone. And one shipping company was looking for a better way to move a huge amount of people. It was an idea every bit as crazy as it sounds. A flying ocean liner the length of a football field, with five decks and a crew of 47. Just to get this million-and-a-half-pound flying boat airborne, Saunders Row envisioned 24 jet engines integrated into the enormous wings. And this plane would have been so big there'd be enough room inside the wings for engineers to walk around. Even service all those jets in mid-flight. Of course, this enormous flying boat never made it off the drawing board. Even more outrageous than its design would have been the cost to get it built, and it would be the last flying boat for Saunders Row. By the 1960s, they shifted to other emerging fields, and soon, Saunders Row disappeared altogether, merging with another British aircraft builder. Meanwhile, the Princess flying boats sat in storage for over a decade. Proposals to convert them into cargo planes, troop transports, even an experimental nuclear-powered aircraft never panned out. And by 1967, all three airframes had corroded, and the enormous planes were broken up and sold for scrap. It was the largest and most advanced flying boat airliner ever built. Strangely futuristic, but also archaic at the same time. A plane designed for a future that never existed. Choosing my next topic isn't as easy as it sounds. I have to consider whether it'll do well with YouTube's recommendation algorithm that decides which videos to promote to viewers. I also have to worry about whether my videos will get demonetized. And that means most military topics are just too risky. 
YouTube decides which videos you watch, and it also influences which ones I create. It's time to do something about it. By now, you've heard that just $2.99 a month gets you access to thousands of big-budget documentaries on CuriosityStream, and to Nebula, where independent channels like Mustard are free to create the content we want to create. In a few weeks, I'll be releasing my first Nebula original, a video about a secret Japanese World War II machine that almost changed the course of the war. Nebula is home to a growing number of originals, and it's where you can support Mustard and content from your favorite educational creators, free from ads or sponsor messages. If you're looking for a deeper dive into fascinating topics, CuriosityStream is where you'll find thousands of high-quality documentaries, from history and nature to engineering and design. Get a free month of both CuriosityStream and Nebula when you go to curiositystream.com mustard and use the promo code mustard when you sign up.